Hello. This presentation, as you can see on the board, is on ducks, surgical masks, and gas injection. And is in fact going to be a discussion of wettability in three-phase flow. But what do I mean? Well, take here a children's book, right? Ducks don't get wet, okay? Here's a duck not getting wet, a plastic duck, obviously, but ducks don't get wet, but they have feathers. And they don't get wet even though their feathers are full of air. The air is trapped in order to form an insulating layer, but they spend all their time in water. Why doesn't the water soak in to the feathers? Well, in the children's book, no matter how many times they go into the water, ducks don't get wet. They're waterproof, but why? Well, it says here, because it has an oil gland behind its tail and it strokes this oil gland and preens the feathers. This is how they keep their feathers covered with oil. Water rolls right off the oily feathers. So it's something to do with oil, something to do with water, and of course we're in the presence of air. Now what about surgical masks? Well, this is obviously very current. Here I have my mask. How does this work? So you think, oh yeah, it's like a, it's like a tissue. I've got a tissue here, it, you know, my sneeze or cough, it forms a barrier, you know, to protect others or indeed to protect yourself. Is that really the case? Think about the ducks. If it soaks up the droplets, the coughs and sneezes, and then you keep it next to your face all the time, is that really ideal? So actually, how do, how do these masks work? How in particular do the more sophisticated masks that you might see in intensive care? What's behind those? And the last one is gas injection. That's um, injecting gas into porous rock deep underground, which can be done to improve oil recovery. So you can inject the gas to displace oil, but you can also inject carbon dioxide deep underground. And is that gonna work? Is that gas gonna stay underground? Or is it going to flow readily? And is it going to escape? So those are the topics today and I do have the blackboard because the whole secret behind understanding this is to understand wettability and the contact angle by which two phases make with a solid surface. So let's go through that. And this many people may be aware of is uh, the Young equation. So imagine I have a solid surface like this and imagine we'll talk about oil and water, you know, if we're talking about oil recovery, so we're putting, you've got oil deep underground in a piece of rock like this, okay, and water is also present. Then we'll have a contact between the water and the oil, and we measure a contact angle between the two, and that's traditionally measured through the denser phase, which in this case is water, so this is the oil-water contact angle. This is the solid. We have an interfacial tension, which is an energy per unit area between the oil and water, which we label sigma oil and water. We also have a tension between the oil and the solid and between the water and the solid. And these are energies per unit area, but they actually do act as a tension. Essentially, it's energetically unfavorable to have these interfaces. They're sort of dragging to try and cover the interface. And there is a horizontal force balance, which is the Young equation, that relates this interfacial tension to the horizontal component of this plus this. So that's the Young equation. The equation is sigma on the surface, sigma water surface plus sigma oil water and the horizontal component is the cosine of the angle. Okay, that's fine, but we're talking about oil, water and air, or if we're underground, oil, water and gas that could be natural gas, mainly methane or carbon dioxide uh, to mitigate climate change. So let's also consider the combinations if we have three phases, and we'll call this third phase not air but gas, to be more general. So we can have exactly the same, okay? This can be water, 
and this can be gas. Okay. And we can have the third possibility. Okay, and this will be oil, and this will be gas. And again, we measure the contact angle through the denser phase. So this is gas water, this is gas oil. Now, one key thing, and this is going to be absolutely vital in what follows, I've shown this contact angle here less than 90 degrees. Doesn't have to be less than 90 degrees. But that's going to be the whole point of the discussion. Okay, so I've measured it through the water. I'm not, not, not assuming that it's less than 90 degrees. It's whatever it happens to be. Okay, so the cosine can go negative. Okay, so let's just uh, label all this. This is sigma water surface, sigma gas surface, so sigma gas surface, and sigma water surface, plus sigma gas water. And then this one, I'll just have to label it all. Sigma oil surface, sigma gas surface again, sigma gas oil. So this is sigma gas surface again, so it's the same one as here, is equal to sigma oil surface now, plus sigma gas oil. Of course, theta gas oil. Okay, so we have three young equations. Okay, so that's three equations. How many unknowns do we have? Well, we seem to have oil, water, and gas surfaces, so, three uh, tensions with a solid, three interfacial tensions between the two fluid pairs, oil, water, uh, gas, water, and gas, oil, and three contact angles. So we seem to have nine unknowns and three equations. So that leaves us with six unknowns. So the interfacial tensions and the uh, tensions between the individual fluids. So this doesn't seem to be terribly useful, but it turns out, mm -hmm, no, look at it a little, little bit more carefully, okay? Look at these equations, okay? This one has the gas surface. So what I could do is I could take this one from this one, couldn't I? I could do a minus sign, okay? Okay, let's see uh, where that gets us. So it's clearly a zero here, okay? And then what we have here is a sigma water surface minus sigma oil surface, okay? And then I've got this one as a positive And this one is a minus. Okay, so fair enough, you might say, but um, what can I do now? Well, if we look at this here, okay, here we've got water surface minus oil surface. So look, I can put zero here and then minus. Sigma oil surface. So this term here, okay, and this term here, right, can be equated. All right, so what I do is I've got this, okay, this is going to be that minus that. Okay, so let's um, put this in. Right, this can go over the other side of the equation, okay? And so what I end up with, okay, if I uh, now erase maybe the intermediate one here, because I didn't need, need that step, okay, is I'm going, to, I'm going to put this into here, okay? So I've got, this is going to be plus, sigma gas oil cos theta gas oil minus this, and I'm going to put this over the other side. So I get straight away to this being sigma gas water cos theta gas water is equal to, I'm going to put this term first because it's traditionally written first, plus, and then this term, right, because it's over that side, Okay, so hopefully that's 
clear, if you don't see the algebra and work through it yourself, you're left with then this equation. And this equation turns out to be rather powerful. Okay, I will get rid of the intermediate steps because it will just be confusing. This is the main equation for today. And this equation relates the three fluid fluid interfacial tensions, gas, water, oil, water, gas, oil, okay, and the three contact angles. So in fact, we don't have three interfacial tensions and three contact angles that are basically, they are what they are, and you have to measure them. There is a relationship between them, okay? And the relationship between them is simply through invoking equilibrium. It's actually relatively simple, just, just invoking those three uh, young equations. Okay, so this equation is called the Bartel Osterhoff equation. After the two people who first derived this in the 1930s. Okay, Bartel Osterhoff equation. Okay, so from the young equations, you can derive uh, the Bartel Osterhoff equation. Okay, so what's the significance of this? And what's it got to do with ducks, surgical masks, and uh, gas injection? Okay, well, let me, let me explain. The contact angle between oil and water is basically related to what I would describe normally as the wettability of the surface. So if we have a clean rock, okay, or if we have a tissue like this, these are, this is a silica surface, this is a natural fiber, these are naturally water wet. So the contact angle between oil and water will be close to zero. So this cosine will be close to one. What about the contact angle between gas and oil? Normally, and I've described this in a previous video, you often have that oil will spread on water or will almost spread on water. And so when you have a, a gas oil interface, the contact angles here, if we look here, this is gas oil, the oil is spreading typically. And so you tend to find that this contact angle is also close to zero. So in most circumstances, this angle is relatively close um, to zero, so this cosine is close to one. If it's water wet, this one will be close to one. So let's, let's talk about that. Let's go through the first, first example, okay? If we're water wet, right, we have cos theta oil water is close to one, and this one we're going to be close to one in any event. Okay, so now we can write out the implication for this. We get sigma gas water cos theta gas water is approximately So what we see is that this cosine is going to be given by the sum of these two divided by these two. And again, we haven't discussed it in this video, but when oil almost spreads on water, it's because the force balance between the three interfacial tensions basically adds up, which means that this interfacial tension is approximately equal to these two. So as an example, the interfacial tension between air and water at ambient conditions is about 70 millinewtons per meter. If we take an oil such as octane, this is about 50 millinewtons per metre, and this between, this between octane and water, between octane and air is about 20. So 50 plus 20 is 70, this is 70, so this number is about one. So that makes perfect sense. The contact angle between gas and water is about zero because it's water wet. Well, that's obvious, isn't it, right? This is, this is water wet in the presence of oil, so it prefers water that is also water wet in the presence of air, isn't it? So that was a bit of a, that hasn't told us anything uh, useful. It says that cos theta gas water is approximately one, so theta gas water is close to zero. Okay, um, not terribly staggering. Okay, let's now look at the second example that is going to be interesting, right? And much more interesting, right? Much more relevant is what happens if you're like the duck? What happens if you preen your feathers and you keep your feathers 
oil work. So you keep your feathers coated in oil. The feathers form a porous medium, okay, a sort of fibrous porous medium, trapping air because air has a low um, uh, heat conductance, right? So it keeps the duck warm and dry, okay? And it does so by keeping those feathers oily, okay? You have to have oily feathers. So in that case, if the feathers are covered in oil, it's oil wet, isn't it? It likes oil, it's covered in oil. So if I put oil on oil, it likes oil. So we know that it's oil wet. So in fact, if it's oil wet, that means that the contact angle that oil makes is zero. The contact angle through the water is 180 degrees. The cosine is minus one. If it's oil wet, the cosine is minus one. So this makes this angle, this makes this minus one. So if we have oil wet, okay, then cos into oil water is approximately minus one. Okay. So now, Let's go through the bottom of the equation. Okay, we do this, and this is minus here plus here. But typically, I said typical interfacial tensions here are around 50 millinewtons per liter. This is about 20, so this is negative. So cos theta gas water is also negative. What this means is if I have a solid surface, okay, and this is an oily surface, okay, I know if I put oil on that surface, the oil will spread, it likes the surface, it's got oil spread there anyway. But if I put a water droplet on in the presence of air, it's a droplet like this. So this will be water, this will be my gas. Okay. Now, what that means is, that the contact angle between gas and water is greater than 90 degrees. Water will form a droplet, so the contact angle shown here, theta gas water, is greater than 90 degrees. Okay. So what does that mean for ducks? It means they've got these feathers, they preen the feathers with the oil, water forms a bead on the surface and runs off. In fact, to get the water inside a porous medium, if the contact angle is greater than 90 degrees, requires a positive pressure in the water. You'd have to hold down the duck and inject the duck with water, okay? That doesn't happen. So that's how the duck stays dry. Do we see it in other examples? Yeah. Imagine sheep, right? Sheep in a field, they've got a woolly coat. When it rains, the water doesn't soak into the wool. Why? Because that wool, wool is naturally oily. When we shear the sheep and make a woolen jumper, we clean the wool so that it actually soaks up water in the rain. Okay, if we go outside and we want water just to run off, we have a plastic jacket. What's the plastic made out of? It's made of oil. You know, in this tabletop, if I were to spill some water on this tabletop, it forms a bead. Why? Because the tabletop's been varnished with an oily surface. Right? It doesn't feel sticky, but it is oil wet. Okay, and there's a good reason for that. If I had natural wood, okay, and I spilled coffee or wine, okay, I'd stain the wood, wouldn't I? I'd soak in and stain it. Okay. Instead, by making it water repellent, the water runs off, and this is the reason why. Okay. And you see it in lots of other examples, right? Why are leaves waxy, right? Again, it repels water when it rains, the water runs off. Actually, why? You don't want the water to soak into the leaf, because actually the, the plant is taking water from its roots. The water is soaked up in the roots, goes up, and then you have holes in the leaves, stomata, which allow the exchange of gas so that the plant can take in CO2, create oxygen during photosynthesis, and when it's respiring, do the opposite, like we do, take in oxygen and produce CO2, you need an exchange of gas. If you allow the, the water to soak into the leaf, it will be choked with water, and the plant essentially will suffocate. Okay? So again, leaves tend to be oil wet. Lots of examples. Let's talk about surgical masks. Let's finish this now with what we were talking about. These surgical masks, actually, if you take one of those and dip it in water, they're slightly water resistant. In fact, they don't naturally soak up water. And in fact, if you want to use a more um, sophisticated surgical mask, the idea is, okay, it's got a fine mesh, but it can't be too fine a mesh, otherwise you can't breathe through it. So what sort of mesh do you want to protect any droplets of water getting to you? You want it to be like the ducks, don't you? You want it to be oil wet. 
the meshes are made out of plastic polypropylene fibers. Okay, so those fibers repel the water. The water doesn't go inside the mesh, right? Just like a duck keeps that mesh full of air, okay, which means you can breathe through it. It's not blocked up with water and it keeps it safe. But there is a snag. You can have airborne infections clearly in uh, aerosols. And there the particles are sub-micron size. And in fact, they're sufficiently small that they can actually get into the mesh. Now that's a problem because if the mesh is oil wet, it actually repels the droplets. The droplets are kept as little droplets and might migrate through. So in fact, you also want a layer that's waterworked. You want a layer that actually attracts the very smallest droplets and contains them on the surface, that actually likes them on the surface, plus a layer that's repellent. And in fact, that's how these surgical masks are designed. They have alternating layers, a water wet layer for the very finest sprays, so that actually those tiny sub-micron droplets are attached to the solid surface. And then, or the fibrous surface, and then fibres that are oil wet that actually just repel the larger drops. Now, what does it mean for gas injection? Okay, you recall, well, I described birds, right? How birds uh, keep themselves warm and dry. Um, how you might design effective surgical masks that you can breathe through, but which protects you from the droplets of all size, water droplets of all size, and obviously the uh, pathogens that are dissolved in the water. And what about gas injection? Well, if I inject gas underground, say CO2, and I store it um, in a reservoir that's full of water, that's actually naturally water wet. Okay, so the gas actually can move quite readily underground. And the way in which I can contain the gas safely is to trap the gas in the largest pore spaces. But one other possibility is you can put the CO2 in an oil field, a depleted oil field. The reason for that is you get some extra money out because you inject the gas and it pushes some more oil out. Um, it doesn't help you with climate change, but it does help you economically. And you have, you know that you have a body of rock underground which can store fluids for geological time. So it seems like a safe. So what do you do there? Again, traditionally, people assume that the gas goes in the big pores, it flows readily. And so this looks bad because you don't want to inject gas and then produce gas, you want to keep the CO2 underground. And so the idea is, again, that you should inject water, you should have the water trapping gas. Actually, in most reservoirs, that isn't true. That isn't necessary at all, right? And the reason is, most oil reservoirs, they've been in contact with oil. The contact angle here, here, this contact angle is greater than 90 in most cases. So this is negative. This may be positive, but gas and oil, CO2 and oil, are subsurface, they're both quite liquid-like. The interfacial tension is really very low. So when we have an equation like this, this term is negative. This term is almost zero. So the wetting properties of the gas in the water are very similar between the oil and water. And in fact, we'll tend to beam that the gas is what's known as intermediate wet. It can spread in layers. It's confined to smaller pores. It doesn't flow so readily. And so therefore, the idea is if you want to recover oil, you inject gas, that's good. The, the, the gas track, uh, pushes out the oil. But also if you want to store it safely, you don't necessarily need to worry about having water injected as well. You just inject the CO2, it stays there underground. It doesn't flow so readily. And it doesn't so flow so readily, again, for just the same reasons why ducks don't get wet. In fact, the air <laughs> right, is not the non-wetting phase. Water is. It's water that's in the big pores. It's water that has the fastest channels. It's water that has to be pushed in. Okay, so just a little um, introduction to this. Very simple relationship here, the bartel osterhoff equation. But it has lots of important consequences, not just uh, for underground flows, but for the design of materials and for explaining uh, you know, how plants and bird life in particular uh, manage to survive. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much.